Simon, so stoked that we could, thrilled to be here with you and so glad that we could take the time and actually get connected now, yeah. which is great. So thank you for taking the time. Um, Simon Jürgenotte. Yeah, Simon Jürgenotte. Jürgenotte. Simon Jürgenotte. Simon Jürgenotte mm. from Holland. From Holland. And now in Bali mm. and running the kitchen and the gardens at Bali Silent Retreat. Yeah. Which is an amazing venue. I've looked at it online and I've heard amazing things about it. In fact, mm. a friend of mine was there just recently and she said it was just extraordinary. She said, just go. So I'm really excited to, uh, to come and visit that mm. and see the, the work that you're doing there. And stoked that we could take some time now to connect and hear a little bit about your story, what you see as some of the, you know, the, big, the real challenges that we're facing on Bali and Indonesia, but mm. also globally as, as humanity. And what you see as the, as the best solutions, what you're doing about it and what anybody can do about it, which is kind of the theme for the, whole, for the whole thing. And we've had a bit of a chat before and one of the things that I'm really excited to hear is your, you know, your views on how ecologies work, how permaculture works, how, um, you know, our relationship with nature and just that beautiful connection that you have there. So again, thank you so much. It's great to be connected and I'm um, thrilled to, to be here to, to hear your wisdom. Mm. Where to start? Where to start? Where to start? Well, it's good you mentioned Bali. I feel Bali serves such a special purpose on the planet. And I find it so, <laughs> I'm blown away by how many people still reach this island and, yeah. and go through seemingly life transformative experiences. And that is not just people who spend time in a silent retreat. Many of my family members who visited. They, they will come to Bali and like you said, they, they might even get a little bit sick. And not just Bali, Bali, but things will come to the surface mm. and things change. So I think Bali is a, a very soft, um, like a womb holding us. And at the same time, she's, she's deeply righteous and fair and will show you all of these parts about you. <laughs> you know? And I think the world has a few of those places and Bali is one of them. Um, the Balinese people being just as unique, just mm. as special. It's the only culture. I know that blends in their religion and their cultural identity and everything that they are all into one. Balinese are rock solid, they're Balinese, they know almost what they are and who they are. Mm. And they live it proudly throughout all the changes that tourism brought here, of course, with many, many sure. challenges. So why is that important, I think, for us to honor that on being here? Bali plays an important role because it shows us on a small scale where the world is at. So yeah. Bali is this incredibly beautiful place, man-made beauty, and also natural beauty. And human impact has been so fast here, 10, 20 years, you can yeah. tell the difference and it's, sure. it's visible, pollution is visible here. Yeah. Everything is so visible, so in our face. And a lot of people here experience that and we, we, we cry when we see that happening. Sure. But it's not like it's not happening in our countries. <laughs> you know, in our countries, all of this has happened. Like, you know, you're from Australia. It's been deforested up to 90%. All of the old growth bush, it's all gone. Mm. in uh, the name of progress. And now as humanity, to keep things summarized, we're at a point where we are questioning our own survival on this planet. Yep. So we're in this unique situation as humans where we're asking ourselves for the first time ever, what does it mean to be alive as a human that questions if our next generation will thrive or even survive mm. on this planet? And that's not a small question to ask. <laughs> I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of years of human history. None of us ever had to ask that question. Mm. We did. Like, indigenous Australians came to the continent 60,000 years ago, and they were more powerful than any other species there because they had spears. Sure. So all of a sudden, the evolution game changed where indigenous people were on top of the game because they could spear down. And of course, they would spear all the big mammals. So mammals that were thriving there for thousands of years by being big were now all of a sudden the most vulnerable. So the indigenous people speared down all these mammals and without realizing, they made them go extinct. Mm -hmm. You know, science has kind of been tracing that. But they didn't know because they didn't have the bird's eye view of science to go to the moon and look down on the planet and they go, all right, we're kind of messing up the place. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize they were making species go extinct, but at the same time, their wisdom uh, and their relative innocence made them blend into the ecosystem in Australia and they became a successful part of it. Mm -hmm. Very different from the modern human in the industrial revolution that came, invented all of this stuff to get on top of the food chain so we could slash forests at a huge rate or we could kill species. We, 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 we absolutely thrive in terms of numbers. We went from 1.5 billion people 100 years ago to 7 billion people today. Wow 
directly linked to the invention of things like artificial fertilizer. So we thrive at a massive rate, and now we have equipment and we can measure, oh, that river is polluted. Oh, those forests, we can't live without them. Oh, that ice cap is melting. And we find ourselves bickering over what to do, but we know one thing for sure. We are causing the destruction of our planet. We are causing the destruction of our species. We know we have no excuse, but we can now choose to do something about it. Wow. So I call that conscious evolution. We nice. can consciously decide if we're going to make it. Conscious evolution. And the consciousness comes in because we can choose to look at ourselves and go, what is it in me that rates me higher than that tree or that bird or that plant? What is it in me? And in psychology, they might call this the ego. Okay. The sense of self that isolates themselves from the rest of the world. Say, so you are just this fragment and you have to fight each other with mm -hmm. wars. You have to fight nature with pesticides because if you don't, you won't survive. That's the ego, and the ego is like mm. a parasite that's always fighting everything, trying to survive, and ultimately will kill its host. Sure. Or we go beyond the parasite, the ego, and we merge with who we really are, and we realize, I love you, Patrick. I love you, Tree. I love all of you. How could I possibly want to screw you over in a mm. business deal? How could I possibly want to chop all of you down? Because it's going to kill myself. Yeah. And that, that shift in consciousness is, is the first time that will happen to humanity. Mm. So it's not a small game we're playing. Mm. But it's now come to a point, if we don't play that game, mm. this life form called humanity will cease to exist. Mm. Which probably in the long run doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's probably scariest to our ego. Sure. You know, so maybe the ego was a necessary part for us to, to evolve from our animal-like nature into a species that can honor their intelligence, that can honor that we can sit on top of the food chain if we want to. We have all this technology. But how are we going to use this? Mm. Like we said yesterday, the guy that invented uh, taking crude oil from the planet or inventing aeroplanes, he didn't have the drive to destroy the planet. He had the drive to be faster and better and easier. Sure. And now we're at a point where we're saying, okay, we have all that. Now let's invent ways to incorporate this technology in a way mm. that can actually sustain itself. Mm. That is what we're working with. So it takes a new level of thinking. Mm. And you can't, you know, solve it in the old way. We need, we need the new way. Wow. And, and to turn all that into cooking, what I'm working with is ways of producing and mostly preparing food. Mm -hmm. That's going to do just that. Wow. You know, it's not strictly vegan. Or oftentimes it is plant-based. It's, it's not rigid. But it's just honoring that inside us. What is it going to take for us? And it's going to be different all over the world. The way I cook and prepare food and grow food in Bali is very different from the way I do it in Australia or in the Netherlands or in America. But the basic premise is always the same. Mm. It's asking, what do you want to feed us, Mother Nature? Rather than, I'm hungry, what I want to eat. Um, mm. the, the latter being a masculine approach. Sure. And even an organic farmer can be very aggressive and masculine. If he has a piece of land and he knows lattice prices are high, so I just want to grow lattice. And I'll come in and I start plowing and digging and spraying my organic cowpea and everything to do to shape Mother Nature in a way that I can grow my lettuce. But the feminine approach, the new evolved approach, or the more holistic approach would be to say, all right, so we'll have rainfall, we have trees. What, what would want to grow here? Oh, look, these vines just want to crawl. Let's do passion fruit. Mm. And I don't care if there's a market for passion fruit. We'll have to create a market. People will have to start eat, eating passion fruit around here. Mm. And oftentimes when we ask those questions, uh, the things that come out of nature are really delicious. And that's probably why the food at Bali Sano Retreat has become so successful. And it is so tasty because it comes from that mm. turning point. It's almost like, oh, I can't believe you didn't think of that earlier. <laughs> so it has a little bit of that. Makes total sense when you say it. I mean, I love... What's really standing out for me now is, is, is your passion, is your heart for this. And I, we, I really get, get that, get your heart for this, and it's really beautiful. Um, also, what I really admire is, is the perspective that you've got, because a lot of the time, you know, we've got a little problem or we've got a challenge or we see some pollution or some destruction or some devastation, and we can get really judgmental about that and go, this is what that person's doing wrong, or this is what, you know, this is the problems with the world today, and we can kind of get stuck in that. And you're looking at the whole thing and going, well, this is just where we're at, yeah. and we get to make choices, and here's how we can move forward. 
So with that in mind, I'd love to hear a few things. One, um, first, before anything, tell me a little bit more about Bali Silent Retreat. Tell me about the gardens, the food, the, what's happening, what's that all about? It's a magical place. It's been built by a lady who had a vision. And typically for such a vision, things started falling into place. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a story worthy of its own interview. Okay, what's her name? So her name is Patricia and um, she, she had a vision, a very strong vision to, to, to build this retreat. And I think this whole story is worthy of an interview in itself. But it's okay. just been this beautiful alignment of events where the right people came along and this retreat was being built. And I came in at a time that the retreat was kind of ready to open and they were looking for a chef. Uh -huh. And I happened to be in Bali. It was wow. this perfect kind of synchronicity of events. And um, I arrived there and I looked around and I, was, I felt like home. Wow. Um, and it's not to say that the last four years haven't been without any challenges, <laughs> because the, the spirit of Bali Sign Retreat seems to dictate that if it wants to happen, it's going to happen, but it's not down to as much personal choice. I mean, of course there is, we put a heart and soul into it, but there seems to be a real force behind it mm. that wants to be there and it wants things to be a certain way. Mm. Patricia would call it the lady spirit that okay. roams the lands and keeps things in check. Wow. Um, but there really is a spirit to this yeah. place and you see it with everyone involved, mm. everyone who's shouldering it from the, from the housekeeping to the reception to the volunteer yoga teachers, everyone who's involved um, lives that and has to face their own little personal <laughs> in order to, to do that. So being mm. at Bali Sign Retreat has been a journey of, of personal growth for sure. Wow. Um, Patricia gave me a, a blank canvas at one point to say, hey, look, stop doing the food. Yeah, this is your thing. And for me, it was, it's the ultimate playground. I mean, four Perfect. hectares of land, um, a wealth of knowledge with all of the local people involved who've lived on this land for generations mm. and who understand this land. And I had to start from scratch. And when I talked about the masculine farmer before, I had to face my inner masculine, rigid, determining like, oh, I want to grow this. I want, I want to have this parsley because I used to use this kind of parsley in my other dishes. Like, I, of course, you know, I had wants and needs. Yep. And it's been this ongoing communication with nature mm. and she was brutal on me in the beginning in wow. the gardens where she was attacking me with mosquitoes and I kept cutting myself and you know I felt like uh, a farm pig for the first time out in the wild and I kept <laughs> falling over and you know and the, the garden guys were just you know laughing but just taking me under their wing and taking me to their house and showing me how they cook traditionally. Yep. And I realized also that what we're seeing in this rural Bali, this countryside, the last slivers of Balinese culture at its finest. Wow. Uh, talking about getting rice fields, uh, snails and eels and, and leaves and shoots and roots from the jungle and putting that together in dishes. None of these recipes are, are being written down. Wow. And they're slowly but surely being replaced by pot noodles yeah. from Jakarta, you know, in the local Warung. So part of our conservation there is actually taking care of that side of things. Wow. And I started to realize for Fantastic. my food, I would love to use their ways, I would love to use their spices and leaves and roots, but I also want to turn it and give it my own twist, my modern twist, also the wants and needs of the modern um, spiritual seekers and yogis and your average Joe and anyone who will come to a silent retreat mm. to spend time with themselves. Beautiful. You know, and that's kind of turned into our cuisine. But more specifically on Bali Silent Retreat, its main yep. purpose is to hold space okay. for people to be silent. Mm. So there's no um, real forced activities, there's no real forced programs, but there is yoga, there is meditation, you know, there is food, there is a library, there's a water temple, there's a labyrinth of walks, so there's stuff to, to do, but it suggests to people to mainly go there and, and be, be themselves, mm, wow. uh, be with themselves, be with their thoughts. And why is that so perfect for my idea about human evolution? We're talking conscious evolution. We're talking sure. like the answers are within us. You know, when a fish um, realized that the ocean water was dropping, and the fish realized it's time to grow some legs, otherwise I might not survive. No one had to tell the fish. Mm. Evolution comes from within. So if we're in a, in a state of evolution as humans, we're on the brink of something really big, then the answers are within. Mm. So we're being conditioned through our schooling system, through our upbringing to be something in life. And that mm -hmm. will what society wants us to be might not match up with our evolution. Wow. So when people come to a silent retreat and they, they don't talk, they're away from their mobile phones, they're away from the, what we call the real world. Yeah. No, no mobiles, yeah. no Facebook. No Facebook. No. 
Can you imagine? No gratification. Oh my God. Yeah. No approval from. You just sit there with yourself, and something magic happens. Yeah. And you don't even have to meditate. It helps, but sometimes it can be a bit much. People just sit there, and then they eat this food straight from nature. And they might read some inspirational book, or they just sit in that energy, and they start to realize I'm so unhappy. I really don't can't be with this husband anymore. But my whole conditioning tells me wow. we should stay together for life. Or Oh God, I just realized I really want to marry this man. He's bringing me, you know, like things like that. I realized I just have to quit this job. I know I just love making cupcakes. I have to start the cupcake business or I have to start teaching the neighborhood kids. Or the, people have these huge revelations. Wow. And then fear comes in from their conditioning. Oh my God, but how's it going to pay my bills? Sure. So they go through, and this is just an example. I mean, sure. I can't describe the enormity of what people go through there. Wow. It's not for me to know. But it's all happening. And all it took was a silent retreat and a bit of that Bali magic. Mm. And rice farmers around the retreat, they look and they see all these people coming and they're like, so there's no meat and there's no alcohol and they don't talk and there's no beach here. What are they doing here? What are they doing? <laughs> What's the secret? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> we say, right. it's you. It's, it's, they actually forgot what it's like to be you because mm. you are there with your rice fields. You still got it. Mm -hmm. your, your children are losing it already. <laughs> Don't lose it. <laughs> wow. There's that beautiful interaction between, mm -hmm. between those uh, different uh, parts of, uh, of the world wow. happening. Yeah. I get a bit carried away. I, I love it. I mean, I could, I could listen to this all day. It's yeah. just fantastic. Because what I'm hearing is so much of, you know, what, what's going on and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, every sentence is so loaded with purpose and meaning. Yeah. And there's, there's such a strong philosophy behind it, mm. which is what we're hearing. It's, it's just beautiful. And it's, it's so honoring to humanity, so honoring to nature. And also there's such a challenge in that to let's, let's be present to what's going on. Let's not kid ourselves that changes are happening and that there are some challenges that we're dealing with and that we need to make some choices. Yeah. So, with that in mind, if you were to consider, you know, probably some of the biggest challenges that we're looking at and some of the choices that we're facing, what, what are the kind of things that you'd be looking at that are going, hey, these are probably the things that we want to be not giving our attention to, but be aware of that, that are part of current reality? You want, you want me to point out challenges for humanity some physically of, yeah, in the world? Yeah, some of the things that you're looking at. Okay, well, some of the challenges um, are, of course, pollution. Mm -hmm. of course destruction of our, our natural um, resources I don't even think we should ever speak in terms of natural resources right? they're not ours to use okay um, how do you mean oil gas wood um, minerals minerals it is um, economically an illusion to put a price on such a thing because when they're gone they're gone yes but to an economist but come on we've got sustainable forestry and we're recycling so we can use the aluminium and the gold and the things from your mobile phone and I mean what about what about that? Maybe I, I well, I'll set you I, up a little I, bit I here. To, no no it's, it's good it's really good to question because I'm not denying that I'm gonna jump on my motorbike and rely on them yeah. so I'm not judging like sure. we said before we've come this far but this is just a philosophy behind it mm. maybe this will illustrate it okay economic growth mm -hmm. so to an economist there's ongoing growth sure. needed. So the moment it doesn't grow, we call this uh, a recession yeah. or a depression. But look at a forest. Let's take forests as the natural way of being in the world. Okay. Um, if an economist would walk into a forest in autumn and it sees all the leaves dropping and it sees animals start dying, you might say, this is a disaster. Having a recession. We're, we're in recession. Sure. But God forbid he comes in winter. Yeah, yeah. Everything's dead. The Everything's animals are dead. gone. Like, what are we frozen. doing? Here? Exactly. So, forests are teaching us that we need death, and death is not the end of life. Death is simply the opposite of birth. Okay. Life is ongoing. Life is expressing itself through these various life forms. Mm. You know, it's a tree. It's a person. Um, but you look at a compost heap, you might see a lot of death, but you dig a little deeper, and all you see is life just mm. teeming away. And actually, without that death, the forests wouldn't be so good the next year. Mm. Because forests teach us that um, ongoing expansion, as what we as humans are looking for, is possible. 
within the realms of nature, within the boundaries of nature. If we let nature and all this intelligence and wisdom that goes far beyond our mind dictate our expansion, and mm -hmm. what we see is thriving. We're sure. thriving. We need all elements. Mm -hmm. We need those precious birds because they give their life to the soil and then the worms will come from the bottom and they're doing the plowing, not the machines, mm. you see? We have those trees digging up deep into the ground, digging up those minerals, bring them up to their fruits. Now we can eat the fruits and get to the minerals. We're not gonna deep, dig seven meters deep to get to the minerals and put them in a supplement, we just eat the fruit. Sure. You see what I mean? So if we're looking wow. at those models of nature, we're seeing that it's ongoing expansion is needed as mm. long as we value ourselves as a part of that. Mm. And that's what I'm saying. When we ruthlessly destroy those forests, we don't understand what we're destroying. And that's what have, we have been doing. Mm. And you might put a price on a forest and a price on this and a price on that, but these things, when they're gone, they're gone. And then we're not talking about birth and death. We're talking about extinction, mm. which is now happening at a at a very high rate uh, due to the human approach. Mm. And extinction is the, uh, the end of birth. And then mm. it's gone. And mm. what we see is that we need this incredible wow. variety in nature. So that's why I'm saying that I don't like putting a price on what we call natural mm. resources. I'm not saying <coughs> that we can just say goodbye to it today. It's all the system that we built are relying sure. on it. I mean, yeah. anything you touch almost relies on crude oil in the way it's being yeah. produced um, well, it's it's today. oil or chemicals right the whole yeah so I question when when you buy food like this sticking specifically to food is does it involve crude oil if you mm. buy it at a supermarket it involves crude oil on all levels it starts at the top where crude oil is needed um, in the agrochemical industry yep. to produce the seeds to produce the fertilizer the pesticides and then the machinery to do the plowing um, the packaging, the processing, the transport to the supermarkets. So by the time you eat the meal, it's one liter of crude oil involved in your meal. Wow. So imagine how much, you might say, I ride my bicycle, but you're still using all that crude oil. Yeah. And this stuff is harder and harder to find. So the prices will go up. It might never run out because at one point humans are gonna say, that's just, too, I'm not gonna go all the way digging underneath that, that reef that coral reef and yeah. put so much at risk to get to that oil, we need to find a different way. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, and so is Germany apparently, like, let's just start today. Let's just say by 2030, I think they're saying combustion engines are, are finished. Like, wow. you know, some governments are now realizing that how Wow. But of course, BMW, it, Mercedes Benz, Porsche. Mm, wow. So I read, and I can see those clever Germans behind the scenes yeah. just developing, so they're ready to be on top of the game. So I think, economically speaking, if you are so invested in your wealth and well being, even this system still makes sense. Yeah. It's not just uh, a tree hugging system, mm. even though it, it, it does. It's real longevity. It, there's real longevity and sustainability mm. in, in thinking outside of this uh, current system. I love, I love how you're talking about, I mean, we're looking at ecologies mm. and you're going, if the economist walked into a forest, you know, it's a beautiful analogy because what the economist is concerned with is, is economy, which in many ways is kind of the opposite of ecology. Economy is the management of scarce resources. Ecology, economy says we don't have enough, there's only so much, and for me to have more, you have to have less. And if you have more, I have to have less because that's all there is, yeah. and they're trying to manage that, but we don't see that in nature. We don't see that. When you walk into the forest, we don't see economy, we see ecology. Yeah. Right? So tell me about, about how an ecology works. And I'd love to, I saw, a, um, saw the little fish pond up in your room mm. there, and I'd love to we'll get, a, get a shot of that. But tell me about how an ecology works, and then we'll go and have a look at that after. Well, I'm not an ecologist, okay. but I have spent extended time in nature, and I do see a lot of things happening here. Of course, first thing we see in nature is competition, especially the tropics. We see everything and everyone competing for the light. Yeah. But that's beyond that, beyond the competition, of course, because we all want to thrive, we see people, um, we see a life form supporting each other. You know, I just look right behind me, there's one tree that's yeah. there, it's got its roots deep in the ground, then there's another life form here that yeah. lives on the tree, feeds off the tree, and some leaves will drop, and then we'll hold that into place and create a little pinch of compost here, and we'll feed on that. There's ants crawling up this tree doing their business, there's a vine, crawling up that tree. So they're all looking for light, competing for light. They're all looking for nutrition, but they're mostly all supporting each other. Uh -huh. There's a little understory here that grows underneath quite happily in the shade. Would it be in the full sun? It'd probably get burnt. Mm -hmm. You see, so 
<laughs> they have chosen, and all these symbiotic relationships are beautiful. Sometimes they're helping each other. Sometimes one is just feeding off the other, the other one doesn't care. And mm -hmm. sometimes there's a parasitic relationship, mm -hmm. one starts feeding and the other will die. Mm -hmm. And all of those things happen in nature and in the human world. And look at your own friendships, and you probably recognize oh, yeah. who's feeding off who. Yeah. And where is my symbiotic relationships, mm -hmm. and where they're at their finest. And we're always trying to balance. Mm. That's good to remember. Your body is actually always trying to get to the ultimate pH level. It's always wants mm. not too salty, not too sweet. It's always looking for balance. And if we honor that, we don't have to start correcting it from the top. We allow this balance to, to thrive. Mm. So that, that is happening in a forest, uh, mutual support. Mm. And if we honor that there is a force that is always looking for balance, if we allow that force, we can be really lazy and kick back and allow it to happen and harvest the fruits. Mm. And that is in a real <laughs> compact way how I grow food and how okay. we grow food and how I like to approach a garden. I don't mm -hmm. like to use little roofs for the rain. I don't like to spray anything even if it's natural. I like things to just give them a good shot, yep. give them a healthy dose of uh, organic fertilizer in the beginning. I might maintain the soil mm -hmm. with, uh, with beautiful mixes of probiotics. I definitely do my mulching. So I might have some human input, of course, yep. to, to support things, but then I want nature to do it. Yep. And that's the way I look at everyone and everything's wow. health. You know, I want it to, to, to thrive naturally. <laughs> I look at relationships in the same way these days. Okay. I'm, I'm not yeah, gonna, well, if a person wants to spend time with me, it will happen. You know, it's like this, this level of self-worth and boundaries and just going like, there is this natural flow in life. And if relationships are really hard work, you probably need to change something. Probably a clue. It doesn't make them a bad person. <laughs> sure. just, just step back a little bit and just see, okay, what am I doing? What are you doing? And then allow it to find its balance. I have a wow. two and a half year old boy in my life. He's not my own, but I'm kind of, I feel like his dad and I, I'm his best friend. And when we hang out together, we do the same thing. It's kind of, okay, you don't want this, you want that. And there's such ease to our relationships wow. now. So he's teaching me a lot because he's a human soul. And yeah. he wants things a certain way and for a reason. Mm. And if he doesn't want to high five someone or give someone a hug, no, of course not. He's got reasons for that, you know? Mm. So really honoring honoring the, the natural flow of things, mm. I guess. And that's how I apply it to, to, to our cooking. Mm. Yeah, if, if, it's, if, if it's too hard work, let's not do it. Yeah. It's probably why I stepped out of fine dining a long time ago. Okay. It's a beautiful art and I have great respect for the chefs who really made it up there. And it's their art form. Yep. But it's not how I want to feed the planet. Yeah, no, sure. I don't want to feed people sloppy processed food. I want to feed people real beautiful food that have the beauty of nature shine yeah. through. And the only garnish we'll use is a beautiful edible flower because there's nothing more beautiful than that. Mm. But uh, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the way I look at things. Yeah, oh, It's exquisite. It's so beautiful. <coughs> so what, um, when we consider you know, this, this philosophy, this mm. idea, all the kind of concepts that we've been talking about, if we were to look at... Well, probably two questions here. One, you know, specifically what, what you're doing to say, here's, you know, here's the challenges and this is what, you know, here's the practical steps that I'm sure. taking. I know we've, we've looked at the garden and we've looked at the food preparation mm. and we've looked at what's happening at the silent retreat. And the next part of that to be would be, you know, what could anybody do who's not a trained qualified chef, who's mm. not a permaculturist, who's, you know, consider someone who, they're living in, the, in this super city, and they've got their supermarkets and their super highways and they've got this this job that they've got to go to to make money that is made up, right? To yeah. buy stuff that they don't need, to impress people that they don't like. Well, there's a lot of stress in that way of living, right? They're driving their car, they're burning their fossil fuels, they're thinking about all these things, they're wondering about the impact on the planet, they're wondering about their children's future and what that's going to be like. They're wondering about the quality of air and, the, and, the, and you know, can, can kids actually swim in the ocean and our waterways and landfill and deforestation and they go, oh, what, what, do I, what do I do with this? What's my response to that? Because then he's still got to pay the mortgage and he's got to take care of the, the wife and the kids and the ex-wife and the, you know, there's all this stuff going on and it's like, there's a lot of stress. And I think if we could, you know, what would you, what would you say to that guy? How can we, mm. you know, because that's not, it's not a rare situation. It's a super common, as I kind of say those things, you know people, I know people and there's millions of people on the planet billions of people on the planet in that kind of a scenario yeah. to, to varying degrees and maybe they're doing the yoga or maybe they're doing you know some some meditation or some spiritual practices maybe they're looking at vegetarianism maybe they're not maybe they're just going it's all too hard forget it you know we'll just let it be case it are you know what i mean like what what do you mm. what do you make of all that what would you say to them 
So I'm hearing two questions. Yep. One re specifically relates to Bali Sino Retreat. Yes. And what, uh, so let's say, what is a hospitality business doing in Bali practically? Mm -hmm. Right, I'm hearing that. And I'm hearing for your your average person, or no one's average, but for your person who's just like, all right, like, I'm pretty new to this, what do I do? Sure. So they're two really good questions, and I'd like to go through both of them. Okay. Is that okay? Perfect. So well, what I'll often do is ask a couple of questions at once, yeah. just to see where you want to go. Yeah. Right? Because so if you want to if you want to do both, that's perfect. Let, let, I'd let's love do to both. hear that. Yeah. Um, so I guess at Bali Sign and Retreat, we're questioning what it means for a, a hospitality uh, setup. Mm -hmm. um, to, to thrive in Bali in 2017 almost, right? Okay, yeah, almost. And you know, you're looking at the history of Bali. Uh, over 100 years ago, the, the, the Dutch were still here, mm -hmm. um, destroying the last of the kingdoms. And we had kings here, the last regencies, committing ritual suicide. And wow. they came at a point where the European colonists realized that we're destroying something really special. This aggressiveness that worked in other parts of the world does not work with the Balinese. These people are so connected to spirit and they're so connected to their land. They are willing to slash their own throats in front of us. <laughs> we need different people. The news came wow. to Europe at the time and in the media like the, the cruelty of the Dutch Empire. And the Dutch realized we have to do something as far as I understand. Now, this is very complicated history. I'm not pretending to know every detail of it, but this is what I'm seeing. Sure. They realized in in, in 1913, we need, we need to preserve Bali. And how they were going to do it is start tourism here. The first tourists arrived. So 1906, the last king slashed his own throat, I believe, 1908. 1913, first tourists arrived. This wow. time, they were, they were gonna pay the bill. So seven years later, uh, the wives of the king were mockingly throwing their jewelry at the Dutch. You have this, you greedy bastard. I'd rather take my own life. Seven years later, the first tourists arrived going, hey, what a beautiful island. So to me, and I'm, me being Dutch, wow. I take that to heart. And those tourists had good intentions. They were not all bad people, you know, and they were taken to Sanur, right? Yeah? To the first, you know, and they were taken around Bali. And um, they realized that through tourism, we can preserve and put value on culture. So it's not all a bad thing. And tourism can have that, uh, that aspect of preservation can have that aspect of great respect mm. for something that is just in incredibly beautiful. Mm. And of course, as tourists started growing and, and everyone wants to make money of it, we fast forward 100 years and we look at Bali, as is the rest of the world, in a state of crisis, uh, sanitary crisis, pollution, yeah. uh, water crisis. Sure. You know, and there's a couple of really great individuals uh, creating awareness around that. But for every business to question, everyone who is, has the honor to be in Bali for any given time. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel honored every day. It's like, mm -hmm. what is my role in this? How can we fit in? And I feel at Bali Sanctuary, we ask that question every day, every aspect. How do we fit in mm -hmm. culturally? How do we deal with staff that sometimes need to go off for a week at a time to do ceremonies? How do we relate to these incredible people, not just as staff, but as partners? And mm -hmm. how can we work together and how does their happiness and life satisfaction and their growth value in, within our business system? Wow. How do we deal with the impact of bringing people here who bring along uh, money and waste? Yeah. And all of these impacts, how are we navigating that? It's a question. We're not mm. saying we know the answers. So practically what we see at Bali Science Treat, we deal with that in, in special ways. Mm. And I see our staff being real with our guests. I see there's mm. really beautiful interactions. I see uh, waste management now happening um, that started at the retreat mm -hmm. where all of the uh, garbage gets separated, sorted and, and recycled as mm -hmm. much as possible and there's a program that then fl uh, flew into the village okay. and, we, and we now see village bins and wow. you now see a corporation, not Bali Sanctuary dictating the waste management, we see a corporation of the staff of the retreat Corporation or co cooperation? Cooperation. Cooperation, yeah, yes. Of the staff of the retreat with the villagers, so with their own family, like, hey, let's deal with our waste. Wow. In the beautiful way that only the Balinese or Indonesians know how they call this Gotong Royong, where they just get stuff done. So again, like in the garden, we, we were just almost supporting their natural way of organizing. Because some people say, oh, Balinese aren't organized. I disagree. They okay. build their own roads. They, they have a subak system, highly organized. They just don't have to. to Totalitarian, totalitarian government who is managing it all for them. So they have to figure it out themselves. Wow. So you see waste management happening. 
again, the way I make food decisions, uh, I prefer our own gardens and the gardens of our staff above anything. Mm -hmm. So if I can spend money locally, that will support them financially. Yeah, mm -hmm. We can start relationships with farmers five kilometers away rather than 20 kilometers away. Mm -hmm. So keeping it really local. Mm -hmm. So those are all experiments and examples of how uh, a hospitality business or any business in Bali can relate to its environment in a way mm. that can go beyond this century. Mm. And this is not me saying we have it all figured out. Sure. But this is me saying we're giving it a good go. Yeah. And why? And this I want to tell everyone because it's so satisfying. Because okay. there's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more fun. No end of the year profit <laughs> that we don't really care about compares to an end of the year party where you get together with stuff and you just know that you're friends. Yeah, well. You know, and it's, it's kind of like relating to your environment in a friendly way is ultimately going to bring you happiness and satisfaction. Mm. This elusive happiness that we think we can get through uh, economic wealth sure. <laughs> and through lots of Instagram photos showing how happy we are. It really <laughs> is our relationships to our environment that are yeah. bringing us happiness and satisfaction. Wow. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely a big distinction to be made between <coughs> achievement and fulfillment. Achievement and fulfillment. Yeah. And yeah. the... And the yeah, beautiful, mm. beautiful illustration. And nothing wrong with achievement, for sure. Absolutely not. Right? No. And with achievement without fulfillment, what kind of emptiness is that? Yeah. Right? And yeah. it's hard to get fulfillment without any kind of achievement. Mm. You're not doing anything, just yeah. sitting around trying to feel good. Well, that's probably not, yeah, you know, right. not really the balance either. Yeah. So we're given a, a unique um, opportunity as humans Amazing. right now. We can achieve great things sure. whilst fulfilling the planet. <laughs> yeah. Like, what a unique time to be alive. Wow. And, and that I really want to ties in with the next question. I really want to tell people if, mm -hmm. if they feel lost for purpose. And I know a lot of people still do today. Sure. And some people have found some purpose. It's, 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 it's so worthy of pursuing whatever is brewing inside of you. Because there is, in each and every person on the planet, there's something inside of us that's saying, go, go that way. It's that little voice. Saying, do, do it. Well, I'm scared. Fear comes in. You can start to distinguish between ego and purpose. I want to do it. I'm scared. Why is scared? Because my dad used to say, okay, your dad. So we start working with ourselves. It can take years of, of yeah. inner, inner work. Yeah. Growing those roots, going into our mud, like the lotus flower rising mm. from the mud. It's, it's really not being afraid to find that what's inside of us. But you don't understand, Simon. There's the wife and the kids yeah. and the job and the boss and the mortgage and the ex-wife and the... I know. You don't understand. I can't just go I and know. follow my passion and live my purpose. And what, what are you talking about? Because there's such perfection to your path. Yeah. And some of these people may fall away. Mm. And you're going to cry. And that's why you're human. And it's beautiful to cry. And it's beautiful to feel sad. And it's beautiful to say goodbye. Mm. And it's beautiful to follow your heart. And if you mm. trust, you know, <laughs> if you trust, it will, it will fall into place. But that's what people find hard because mm. the mind likes to be in control. It likes to be in control of the tree, of the family. <laughs> it's a control it's freak. Take care of everything. Yeah. yeah, and it's been told to control. Sure. And you can control for a little while. We controlled agriculture for 100 years and we're lost now. You can't control forever. Yeah. Now who's ultimately in charge here? Mother Nature is on the planet and we can start aligning ourselves with her. Mm. And the moment we take one step towards her, she'll take two toward us. It's really yeah. like that. It's really um, that what you're looking for is looking for you. It's like mm. this. And just find the alignment and boom. Tell me, tell me your story around that because I'm getting some real, I mean, some real emotion on this mm. and some real, when I'm feeling it. And I get that there's, you know, there's, there's, I my guess, I don't know, but it's been a journey for you where there was a time when you were kind of in this situation doing what you were supposed to do and following that path and then you went, you were listening to that voice and did that, did you have that kind of experience or are you just making this up? No, I'm not making it up. <laughs> I very much lived what I preach. Okay. I Let's very much lived that, that. And, and there's been times in my life where I was deeply depressed mm -hmm. and I'd say my whole childhood and bless my beautiful parents and everything who was there. Uh, who were there supporting me, I just was deeply unhappy as a kid mm. growing up in Holland, which is a highly organized uh, farm. Sophisticated <laughs> so developed, it. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a flat country. It's divided into blocks and it works really well. Um, that's an animal. That is an animal. Yeah. Nature is speaking to us. We have an animal in the background. That is, yeah. We'll, we'll see what he does. It usually comes out when the heat starts. Okay. Anyway, I grew up in a kind of a 
a council funded estate, my parents divorced. And in Holland, they have these irrigation channels, mm -hmm. which they turn into these beautiful little rivers. And I went in there and started digging with my shovel, and someone called the police on me. Um, I thought I was doing a great thing. I was building a waterfall to, okay. to promote oxygenation of the water. I was, you know, 11 years old at the time. But the police was convinced that what I was doing was, a, was almost like a crime. It was vandalism. Yeah, it was vandalism. And it's at that time that I realized, and I felt really sad, that I don't belong in Holland. Wow. So by the time I turned 18, I moved away and I traveled the world. And it was countries like Australia who really, you know, traveling through the outback there in a van with a bunch of people, where I really found myself in the wilderness. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was tough because mm. I was so used to luxury and, and, and prediction and, and things being sure. in a certain way. Yeah. Um, probably around the age of 23, 12 years ago, I had a, a what you would call a spiritual awakening okay. where nothing made sense anymore. And um, things that I took for granted, like the way we grow food and the way we live, I all of a sudden started to question. Mm -hmm. And that process kind of came naturally. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything you can force. Mm -hmm. And I know that because certain people in my life um, will never understand what I do. And it's painful when those people are close to you. Like, you sure. Know, but to accept that, to accept that some people are just different, yeah, um, and to also accept that there's something inside of me that is also different, and to honor that mm. was probably the key to get things started. Mm. Yeah, so move forward a couple of years and doing uh, big courses like a two-year energy healing course, doing past life regressions, really digging into my own depth of my mm. soul, whatever you want to put fancy words to it. Um, I think I started becoming more and more what I would call myself. Wow. Not the illusionary self that's a chef or a Dutch or a, a tall guy or whatever you might <laughs> describe me as, yes. but something that speaks when I speak about these things that I believe in. Mm. It goes beyond character, it goes beyond mm. form. I found that and in finding that, it, that's hugely satisfying. Mm. It's also challenging in this day and age because not everyone understands it and it can be a lonely mm. ride. Because sure. I had to say goodbye to certain friends, I had to say goodbye to certain levels of comfort and dive and keep diving. Wow. And it's been the most rewarding experience to know that whatever intelligence behind that drive is supporting me at all times. Wow. Because people like yourself somehow find me and want to do these interviews. Um, you know, because you are living your purpose and, sure. you know, we all find each other and we have this yeah. amazing network and we don't have to worry about the nitty gritty mm. because we're in this, we're in this for the big picture, mm. for the long run, for the survival of our species, whatever noble mm. name you want to give it. Yeah. We're doing this for that. Yeah. Uh, we have no short term goals that we feel we have to compete for. Mm. I never worry about giving away any of my recipes, any of my ways. I never worry about copywriting. I, I just want to share this freely. Wow. And the world Beautiful. supports it overwhelmingly. Beautiful. So that I would want to tell uh, other people what are some of the keys of living mm. this life is to, first and foremost, go within. It's to uh, face your fears. Mm. It's to, 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 to be nice to yourself <laughs> and to find things to be joyful about. Yeah. This is not cold showers and lentils from now on, guys. <laughs> because, come on, we're saving the planet. <laughs> you know, turn off the light. Because it, there's a bunch... Like, nature is not saying... Oh, let's just do one passion fruit today. No, this vine is like, here you go, eat me. And nature's always seducing. Yeah. So whatever it's like a bunch of bananas, right? You can never <laughs> eat that whole thing. I know. And the tropics are like that, but yeah. you see the same around the world in nature and there is abundance. Mm. It's over the top. It's, like, it's always like, come this way. It was so funny. When I, when I arrived, I was looking at all the palm trees. I lived down mm. on the beach and it's just virgin palm forest, just amazing mm. in amongst, the, because we've just left the, left the tree standing. They've built the village in around and through it. And I looked at all the coconuts and I went, wow, we were eating a heap of coconuts at the time, making smoothies and all the yeah. rest of it. And I went, what are we going to do when all the coconuts run out? Mm. This is the mentality that I came with. And I'm like, I realized after three years there, we could never eat them all. It's just, there's an abundance. There's an abundance. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, they just keep growing and they're dropping all the time. <laughs> as long as we care for the system exactly. that's behind and we don't the production of coconuts. And we keep carving them down. And and we don't, and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that is that is the mentality. Like, yeah. oh, there's so much. Let's take it all. Well, that's the other part. And yeah, but it, now we can what start the to... key to abundance is to realize our place in it. Yeah. That's the fuel behind the abundance, not the, not the fruits of the abundance, but the fuel behind it. Okay. I think there's a famous example of New York City's water system, 
where they had a choice economically. Um, the, the town water for New York City was supplied by an area which was National Park, which was slowly being developed. And they could either keep developing it and build a really fancy water system, or they could stop the development, buy the entire park, let it to nature, and then that would supply the water. And economically, this was the better option for New York City. Wow. And that's why they decided to do it. But it's just a clear example of often nature is actually economically the better option. Mm. <laughs> because when it's all around, you know, China's realizing that now planting hundreds of millions of trees. They're wow. like, we need these things. Wow. You know, these are going to come in handy. These are going to come in handy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the, yeah. the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago, yeah. the second best time. Yeah, right now. And, th and there is still hope for okay. humanity. But um, you think we'll make it? Um, it's a rough ride, and I don't think it's guaranteed that we'll make it. It's not written in the stars. Mm -hmm. um, it can be one of those Hollywood movies with a lot of thrill and a happy ending. It, can, <laughs> it may not be. And, sure. and the, the most exciting part is that we're in charge of that. We're in control. So what's it down to? You're in control. It's down to you. It's down to me. It's down to all of us. Um, it's down to us chasing our happiness. Okay. And a lot of people might say, oh, yeah, that's easy for you to say on a tropical island, but what about people in Syria? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not disputing that. It's not some overall, oh, just chase your happiness. Sure. But the, the fuel behind Syria and the fuel behind the Dirty River here are the same, are these egoic mindset. And unless we tackle that, we don't tackle the problems. Mm. So let's close the tap and stop mopping, but just let the kitchen stay dry, you know, kind of thing. It's that... Nice. You know, we keep going for the underlying cause. Mm. And I'm not denying the severity of it all. There are some mornings I wake up and I just cry. And I'll mm. be really honest with that. I cry. I don't want to go to bed. I'm fed up with humanity. I'm fed up with myself, with my monkey mind. I'm fed up with everything. Mm. And I just take a deep breath and I come back to what I'm fed up with. And I go, it's okay. You know, and I'm only just giving it a go. And so are you. We were born into this. We mm. are not responsible for all of it. In fact, we're only responsible for a very, very small part of it. Mm. And that's right here. Mm. And before we start tying ourselves to oil tankers and trees and green peas and that, before we do all of that, and activism may be what you're doing. Sure. You know, praise the heroes who are, come back to yourself. Yeah. And also, if you protest the oil industry, check in with yourself and see how much you rely on it. Sure. You know, I think you can grow some of your own food so you don't rely on the oil industry for your sheer survival you have a lot more voice when you pro bill mollison great permaculture founding father mm -hmm. pretty much he said that you know all these activists they have guns and words um but we have gardens when you have gardens <laughs> that's a real voice yeah, you know wow. so i remember to also stick to what's really important what's his name bill bill mollison mollison he right. he passed away yeah a few months ago. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, and then uh, one of his star pupils, I guess, and best friends, uh, Jeff Lawton, mm -hmm. does some great work at the moment. Um, also online is offering some great courses and has a place in Australia called Zaituna Farm. And these okay. are some of the people who are really showing us in a very grounded, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a spiritual guy, but Jeff Lawton is very grounded, yep. showing you just these systems and how they mm -hmm. work and how they can be applied on a big scale. It's not mm. up to Jeff Lawton or me or you to go around the world and put all this up. It's for everyone mm. to find understanding. And I'm excited about how humanity can bloom. You know how you spread seeds and you don't know what flowers will pop up? Sure. It's a bit like that. I'm excited for people to gain more understanding and start blooming their own unique flowers wow. around the world. This could be the most amazing flowering of humanity wow. so far if we let them. Well, say that, say that happened. Say, say we make it. Say there's a, this amazing flowering and say, best case scenario, ultimate vision, what's, what's the best you can imagine it being? Um, imagine humans living beyond their ego. Mm -hmm. Imagine there's no need to, to argue so much. <laughs> there's no need for all this drama. Imagine there's no need for wars. Mm. Imagine there's no need for, for always being so competitive. Imagine if our, if our focus was more about, you know, if you're happy, I'm happy kind of thing. And a lot of the time we see this already. Sure. It's in us, but then we get scared. I don't think we're innately bad people. 
there's just this sort of a con control system into place that seems to be really outdated. Mm. So imagine beyond that. Man, I could imagine this for days on end. Yeah. You know, imagine what places could look like if nature was allowed to thrive. Yeah. Imagine if, if we weren't so sad and we we're dealing with our innermost inner child issues so we're not drowning our sorrows in cappuccinos at Starbucks all the time. But, you know, we are, we are truly... <laughs> you know, we are in touch with our coffee farmers and, we, you know, it, it, things could be so much more beautiful. I'm just making stuff as we go. Imagine yeah, yeah, if yeah. we were in touch with nature. Yeah. You know, I see I've visited green school. I see those kids running around the gardens. Um, when I took them in the gardens, these are reasonably unconditioned kids. Mm -hmm. They are, well, of course, they're being made aware of the challenges in nature. But mm -hmm. I see these kids are really let go and free. Mm -hmm. They naturally gravitated towards, they all loved harvesting. They mm -hmm. all enjoyed cooking. Mm -hmm. We all enjoy, you know, and you look at this in indigenous cultures. We call, we call them undeveloped and unintelligent, but they're just, first of all, they're so happy. Yeah. yeah and, but it's not to say we have to go back to that, because they are tribal wars. I think this is a general sure. evolution that the whole of humanity is going through. I can see a beautiful world where, where sharing and beauty and love and those things are being put first. Mm -hmm. It could be a very pleasant world to live in. We can have a lot of fun on this planet mm. and it can just be the joy of being alive and we can embrace death and have beautiful big tears when we say goodbye to our loved ones and we can celebrate all of it mm. and not shy away. If someone is feeling depressed, we can say, yeah, just sit with me. You can be depressed. I was depressed last year. I don't need to change you. You know, we can be accepting and mm. oh, I see so many and wow. I see that happening on a small scale. We're trying in places like Ubud Bali and Byron Bay and New York City, wherever, there is pockets around the world. Sure. And it's those pockets that are responsible for the, uh, the flowering. You know, the, like there would have mm. been flowers growing in pockets before this worldwide flowering happened wow. when the first flowers appeared on the planet. Um, Eckhart Tolle describes this scene in a book called A New Earth. Um, it's the same with this. It's not one movement organized by one leader. It's a movement of millions of pockets mm. around the planet that are flowering. And that's important to remember because that gives you power because you can remember, I just be one pocket. I just be my own pocket. You can live in a dense mining town in WA, Australia, <laughs> and you can sit there and say, I'm gonna give you Reiki, and everyone's laughing at you, but you can, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a hug. And I, I'm not saying people aren't hugging there, but I'm saying is you, you can be that beam of light, be the light. somewhere in a re relatively dense place, and you make a bigger difference than hanging out in your yoga studio all day you know, keeping the light to yourself kind of thing. Tell me the story about the first flower. I've heard that story, but I'd love to hear. Well, you can imagine what that would have been what like. What would it be like? You know, no, I'm not like a biologist. I don't, I don't know <laughs> the, the details behind it. But yes, flowers would have appeared at one point mm -hmm. before you know, other life forms were already here. And a flower would have been a relatively rare sight at the time. Sure. Yeah. And there would have been first a day. flower might have only moved, bloomed for a moment. Bloomed for a moment. And then phew, gone. Yeah. Like, like the Buddha or mm. Gandhi, mm. <laughs> gone, you know, and we, and, but they had all the attention. They were like, wow, wow what was that? <laughs> what happened? Let's build a religion on that flower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was Christianity. But now we may be at a time that flowers are starting to become quite, uh, quite common. Mm. You see them on, on, on social media. You see, sure. what's this guy talking about? Share, share, share. You know, it's like, yeah. wow, they're flowering. Mm. And, and we resonate to it. Why do you like a flower? No one really knows. You know, why do you like a sunset? We talked about it yesterday. Sure. There is reasons for it, but it resonates beyond the mind. Mm. There's just something in you that listens to this and you go, oh, uh, that's beautiful. beautiful. I like that. Yeah. I like that piece of music. I like yeah. what this tastes like. I, I like this flower. I just mm. love looking at it. Yeah. Mm. It's chop and put it, give it to my girlfriend. <laughs> She's gonna love me without. It's gonna hide all my ugliness. Please forgive me. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Simon, I'm so grateful for this time yeah, and for what you've awesome. shared and, and the, the wisdom and the insight that's come from your life experience. Mm. And before we wrap up, anything else that you'd like to share? Anything else that you'd like to cover? Anything else? Was, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm just mm. blown away. It's beautiful. It's been such value. It is such value. And it's, it's not even my own stuff. I just really feel I'm like tapping into something greater. And I... 
I'm determined to share this with the world. Mm -hmm. I'm determined to focus on food and cooking. Mm -hmm. And I know that whatever flower you're blooming in, you know, you're, you're doing connection, other people are doing this. So I only want to urge everyone to, to follow this mm. bliss. And don't be afraid of the loneliness and the hard work and struggle, because in the long run, this is what's going to make life worth living. Wow. You know, I'm determined to build a cooking school and welcome people and help them connect to the land. So I'm going to keep doing things in my own perfect way and um, and I hope yeah like I said I hope everyone will do the same and don't give up don't be afraid mm. don't be afraid to you're free uh, the gates are open and yeah, the gates are open the farm is open yeah, it's it's time to go into that forest mm. yeah some people within the gate they're telling you ah it's a wild world out there don't, don't go, go out there yeah you got everything you want you got food and, and like a bed to sleep in and whilst that is great but if you have an opportunity to explore if your soul is calling you, go for it, man. Right it's on. worth it. <laughs> right That's on. all. Wow. We're well, gonna thank you so much for this time. Thank and, you for um, your time. Yeah. Such a such an honor. Mm. Thanks for sharing. All right.